called Gremlins, I knew that I was probably going to get lost in the shuffle to a large extent because I kept I kept thinking about what W. C. Fields said, which I think is like you know, uh, never do a movie with uh, children and animals or something like that because you'll always be upstaged. Um, so, yeah, the whole process with the with with the animatronics and, and the special effects was very very daunting too because it's a thousand times more complicated than it looks like um, on the movie. It looks very seamless and, and, and well done in the film, but actually sh shooting it at times was kind of a nightmare. Does anybody out there got a question for you? Thank you for coming, by the way. And um, did you keep anything from the set? Don't lie. Did you keep anything from the set? <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny. People always ask me that all the time. They say, do you have a gremlin at home, right? That's probably one of the top 10 questions. And, and interestingly enough, um, most people don't realize this, but we, we shot almost the entire, both Gremlins movies, actually. We shot almost entirely on Warner Brothers Studios, with the exception of the, you know, what's now known as the Back to the Future set. <laughs> I like to think of this the Gremlins case the Fall set. And it's the Back to the Future set. Um, that was Universal. So we shot. It's all basically shot on on, um, on the studio. And what was the question again? I'm just chasing up. Something like Captain Tangent here. Oh right, right, right. Um, so what happened was that they would um, because they knew that we had access to all of the Gremlins, they would search our car. <laughs> Because they thought, well, if anyone's going to steal a gremlin or take a gremlin, because you have to understand, most of the really, like, <coughs> the first gremlin that you see that's eating the cookies, and, you know, Francis Lee McCain, who plays my mom, sees him, and there's that incredible animatronic shot of him sort of, like, looking in his face, you know, having that expression. Those things cost about $50,000 a piece in, in 1984 dollars. So we're talking about like a hundred and fifty thousand dollar gremlin. Um, so it was definitely, you know, there was definitely, definitely money on the set, and they knew that. So they figured since we had um, access to the gremlins, that we were most likely potential suspects. So everybody who was involved with the film had their car searched, you know, leaving Warner Brothers. So basically, taking anything gremlin related was pretty impossible. It's kind of like saying, do you take submachine guns through like onto planes? It's like, not really. <laughs> you know, it's pretty difficult to do. So I, they, I, they did let me take a couple of souvenirs. I took the sword that I cut the head off the gremlin with. And I took the, um, uh, the baseball bat that I uh, fought the gremlin <laughs> with. And actually, this is before eBay. Um, both of them I, I ended up actually giving away to uh, people, young, young people who were fans, who were um, physically challenged. So I just, they would say, hey, can I have that? And I was like, see them and they'd be there in a wheelchair and I'd be like, sure, you know, <laughs> take it. I, I don't really need it. So everything that I had, basically I, I pretty much gave away. One thing that I read um, about the production was that, and you mentioned about the expensive the nature of the, of the full animatronic, the, 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 uh, the creature one. I had read that, that some of the gizmo, uh, I guess you could say puppets, were real problematic and that there were some real aggravating aspects of that part of the production. Because he's so endearing and so sweet, and everybody, you can hear everybody in the audience, there's, there's, there's awe that's beginning there. Um, but, I had read that there was some real animosity towards that for a little guy on set. And I was kind of curious if you remember anything about that part of it. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of, most of the time, the gizmo, it was mostly gizmo that would have problems. Um, he was the most, he was the smallest, he was the most delicate. And, um, you know, the dog, uh, Bar uh, Barney, whose real name actually was Mushroom. Uh, <laughs> Barney was just his character name. Mushroom was his actual name. Um, 
Mushroom was an awesome dog, but he was obsessed with the gizmo puppet. He thought it was real. Uh, he was completely sold by it. And so the scene in which we do, uh, where my dad quite, quite accidentally gives me the Christmas present, um, when we open the box and the gizmo comes out for the first time, the dog went nuts. <laughs> and you can see me holding the dog back, actually, in the movie. That was not, like, there were no treats on the gizmo. That You didn't need to, like, put treats by the gizmo's ear to make the dog go after it. The, the dog was just obsessed. So one time the dog um, stepped on the gizmo's ear and ripped it off. And so it looked kind of bad. And so Chris Wayless came over and he was, he was overworked, I guess, and somewhat underpaid because he seemed grumpy most of the time. And he came over and he was just like, oh boy, uh, yeah, oh, I don't know. And, and Joe was, but Joe, I don't know if you've ever met Joe Dante or heard him, but he sort of has a slight squeak to his voice. He'd be like, oh, so how, how bad is it going to be? And he'd be like, oh, I don't know, wow, that's like uh, nine and a half hours, maybe? Nine and a half hours? And we'd look at ourselves, and it would be like 9.30 in the morning, and do the math, we'd go, okay. Well, see everybody back here around 6, 6.30, see if we can get this shot. So I'd have the day off, basically, and I'd go over to Spielberg's office, which was down the, down the road a piece, and play with his E.T. bikes, and look at his Citizen Kane sled on the wall, and play his stand-up video games, like Millipede, and Pole Position, and stuff like that. As long as he'd come in and play with me, and I'd be like, Hi, oh, yeah, Steven, watch me as I kick your ass. And he'd, of course, destroy me being the greatest pole position player ever seen in my entire life. Um, yeah, so I mean, it was definitely, it was definitely aggravating in terms of when it didn't go well. And when it went well, of course, obviously, it was, um, it was great. But Gizmo did break down a lot, so that's kind of why people got a little grumpy about him. Well, you know, another thing most people don't realize about Gremlins is we shot it in, in two pieces. We shot the pieces with, like, me, uh, or excuse, rather, the Gremlins and the human actors, me, Phoebe, White, etc. We did that for about 16 or 17 weeks. And then once that portion was completed, all of the actors were basically done, and they would call in the second unit, and they would do an additional 16, 20 weeks. So... You could go, like, uh, when I finished Gremlins, which I remember was August 4th, 1983, because we started in April, ended in August, I left and I came back in November, and they were all still working on the movie, five day, 14 hour a day, five day weeks. And yeah, they had a, a gizmo on the dartboard because they were over it. <laughs> they, were they were over everything having to do with it. They've been working on it for basically something like eight months, and they just wanted the picture to be finished. They, they, both of those movies, if you ask Joe Dante, both of those movies almost killed him uh, in terms of just the workload was insane. Any other questions out there? Anybody? Right there. I have a question, um, obviously. Uh, do you like watching movies with your kids? Like, you know, one thing I always think about seeing movies at our classes, I guess, like when Christmas or something, like this Macaulay Culkin watching movies with his kids, like Home Alone during Christmas. Like, do you ever share that? Or is it kind of weird doing that? Well, I don't have any kids that I am aware of. <laughs> so, I don't, I don't really have that experience. Um, if I have any kids, I'll let you know. What it's like. But I don't really think I would probably show my kid, my kid gremlins um, probably until they're about 10 or 11. Because, you know, I mean, all kids are different. Some kids can, can see stuff when they're five and be totally fine, and then some kids can be 10 and see something and they can't deal with it. I mean, I know my mom was uh, a somewhat liberal parent. I mean, she took me to the Godfather opening week in 1972 when I was eight. <laughs> So obviously she wasn't really that concerned about me. So when I found the horse's head, this is a spoiler, there's a horse's head in the Godfather. And they found the horse's head in the bed, and there John Marley started screaming. My mom was just like, look down at the floor, honey. It'll be over in just a short period of time. You don't have to worry about it. It's, it's not real. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. 
So I don't know if I'd show my kids that. I have no idea what Macaulay Culkin does. Uh, I'll ask him next time. I mean, a lot of drugs last I heard. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? What was the most fun you had at, between the two movies like on set? Like, pick their day, and is there talk of a Gremlins 3? <laughs> Well, the Perpetual Gremlins 3 question has been answered this May as Warner Brothers has announced it's going to do a reboot and a remake of this movie. So they're going to completely redo it. Uh, whether or not I'm going to be involved in it or not, which is usually the follow-up question to that, is um, still under discussion. They haven't really done anything having to do with the casting. They haven't even finished the script yet. So obviously it goes to script to you know, finding a director to hiring a cast, so they haven't even finished part one yet uh, of that process. So that's the Gremlins 3 question. What was the other part? Oh, most fun moment? Um, I don't know, you know, that's hard to say. Um, you know, I mean, the entire movie was, an unbelievable experience for me. I mean, I'd never even been to California. I was a native New Yorker, so the next thing you know, I'm I'm on a plane and I'm flying to Los Angeles. I'm 19 years old. I have my own triplex in Westwood. I'm there for four months. They were paying me more money than I'd ever seen in my entire life, and that was just the per diem I got every week. And it was just, you know, then Phoebe's there, and Jennifer Jason Lee's coming over, and then Judge Reinhold's introducing me to Eddie Murphy, and it was just like, what the heck is going on here? So it was just a lot all at once. It was pretty, pretty overwhelming experience. You know, the whole thing pretty much burned into your brain forever, as you can imagine. <laughs> I'm sure kissing Phoebe Cates was probably not the best days, right? Well, what was interesting about that was I only ever kissed Phoebe Cates twice in my entire life. Once in Gremlins One, and once in Gremlins Two. <laughs> So yeah, uh, but the first time that I had to kiss her, wouldn't you know, it was the first day that Spielberg showed up on the set. And so everybody, you have to understand something. Spielberg in the summer of 1983, if you look at what had just had happened to him over the last eight years, he did Jaws in 75, Close Encounters in 77, he did E.T. and Poltergeist in 82. The guy was on an unbelievable roll. I mean, two of those movies were the biggest movie of all time at that time. So he was basic. Oh, and he also, don't, let's not forget the little picture called Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1981. So the guy was on fire, and he was only 37 years old. And he had done all of that already. Most people would be thrilled to have done that at 77. So when he came on the set, it was like the king was coming on and people would panic. I mean, it was really kind of amazing, something kind of amazing to see about power. Um, people would be like, Steven's here, so what, Steven's here, Steven's here? People would be like, start looking busy. People would just take their hands out and start doing this. anything to like look busy. Because here comes the king, you know what I mean? Even if they had nothing to do, no one was standing around doing anything. People were suddenly like just, just doing everything, and everyone was just like panicking. And I'm like, what is going on? You know, people like running away. You could like feel him coming. You know, like, what is this thing coming? You know, and he wasn't doing anything. He was just walking and was going, hey, how is everybody? It was how everyone else was reacting to him. It was like pretty amazing. So he showed up on the set. And, uh, and obviously he and Joe Dante had worked together before on the Twilight Zone movie. And um, so we did a scene. And I, if you notice, when we kiss, I've got Gizmo in the in the green bag in between us. And Spielberg goes, uh, wouldn't it be cute if just as they're about to kiss, Gizmo kind of jump, you know, like s sits up in his back and interrupts them when they kiss? Isn't that a great idea? And I'm sitting there going like this, no, that's a hard, that's a hard <laughs> the worst idea I've ever heard. But of course, I'm in, that's what I'm saying inside my head. I'm actually going, yeah, that's, that's an amazing idea. Let's, let's try that, you know? So we tried it, and I don't know, it kind of, I guess it's your matter of opinion on whether it worked, but Joe Dante didn't like it. He was like, okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. No, thank you. Let's just do it the way that it's written like that. And I was like, wow, that's kind of like a baldy thing to say to your boss. You know what I mean? And I was kind of like amazed by it. 
But Spielberg and Joe Dante got along really well, and they were just like friends and chuckling and everything. So, so that's basically what I remember is that not only was I nervous to kiss Phoebe, like pretty kind of terrified to kiss Phoebe, quite honestly, because I was like 19 and she was just like glowing. You know, she was like a UFO in front of just glowing in front of you. You'd be like, ah, oh, kiss it. You know, <laughs> and it was like it was just it was it was intimidating. And so then so then there's Phoebe looking at me, and then there's Spielberg over there. I'm like, well, what? And, you know, so I was way too tense to ever enjoy that kiss in any way, shape, or form. And just like, I was just like, oh, oh, how was that? Was that any good, you know? So, so yeah. And then the second kiss was really weird, was the last shot we did on Gremlins 2. For some reason, it didn't come out right, and they had to like fly me back to redo the kiss, or something like that. And then I remember she was, and then Phoebe, you know, at the time, well, she still is. She was married to Kevin Klein. So now you're like k kissing a woman who's married to a guy you know. And the whole thing was just weird. It just never really worked. Here you go. Oh, so I wanted to ask um, one thing that recently was Sheriff Fowler in Hatchet 3, which you may see that he does a very good job at it. If you haven't seen it, then that's a sure he does a good job at it. Um, what they wanted to ask you about was, uh, in that film you do a heck of a job, and it's not just sort of a fall in, show up, I'm the guy with this name with the movie, you remember, kind of a job. And I'm just kind of wondering from this point forward, are those kind of projects things you're looking for? Is this a kind of uh, more genre things, things you're interested in? Or is it more just as projects come that are appealing to you? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just kind of curious how you're looking at it. Because like I said, you did, I was really, I really, really enjoyed it. I'm going to be really brutally honest here. Um, I kind of take what's given to me. I don't. I'm not. I'd love to say that I sit around with this big box of scripts, going, you know, would I really like to do this genre thing? <laughs> I know, you know, I, there's 17 other scripts I can choose from. You know, they offered me the thing. I was three weeks down in New Orleans, and I, I said, hey, can I do something kind of cool with this part? And they said, like, what? And I said, well, I want, kind of want, to, I want to play him like a kind of over-the-top, you know, southern sheriff that you see, like in horror movies, you know? So that's why I gave an accent and had to talk about this the entire time, you know, because I just wanted to, like, have, I wanted it to be like an over-the-top, fun, fun kind of thing to do. So, I mean, basically, I did the movie because it was offered to me. <laughs> I didn't have to work for it. They're just like, would you like to do it? We'll give you this money and you can go to New Orleans. I said, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Because, you know, it's not, it's not very often that you really get offered movies without having to work for them. I mean, maybe the top 50 men and women do in the world, but most of us working actors here just basically kind of have to take what we get uh, or not. Or, or walk away from it. But um, I really liked Adam Green, and I really liked the Hatchet series. I think he's very clever, the way he does 80s throwback stuff. He has tremendous fondness for the genre, and he is arguably the biggest Gremlins fan, most obsessive Gremlins fan I've ever met in my entire life. Um, so much so that for uh, a gift for him, as a thank you gift for putting him in the movie, I gave him... Um, I went to his house in Los Angeles, and he and his friend Joe Lynch sat down, and I gave the two of them a uh, live Gremlins commentary. Instead of on the disc, I sat down next to them, and they, they could ask me. So I go, here's we're doing this, and then they go, wait, stop. What about here? And so it's like, imagine if there was a DVD commentary that you could actually stop and quiz. And that's what I was. So I did that for him, and he, he really liked that a lot. A lot. Anyone else out there have a question? Right there. Do you have any favorite movies of all time, from like the beginning of movies to now? <laughs> well, that's a somewhat broad question. <laughs> um, I mean, I could throw out a bunch of movies for you that I love. Um, a Clockwork Orange. Yeah. An incredible movie. The Thing. Is an incredible movie, oh, yeah. John Carpenter's version in '82. Incredible movie. Um, the Graduate is a perfect movie. Um, Taxi Driver is an incredible movie. 
obviously I grew up in the 70s, so I'm very, um, uh, very biased by that. Any, th any movie with Raquel Welch, incredible movie. Um, it's probably the first woman I ever fell in love with, with Raquel Welch in Fantastic Voyage. Yep. That was a good one. Um, I don't know. That's, there's a, there's a, there's a, not a lot in the recently, huh? I'm trying to think of a really good recent movie. Um, I like Braveheart a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Lives of Others. I don't know if you know, but that's a foreign movie. That's an amazing movie. Um, I don't know. Within the last third, American Beauty. That's a great movie. Again, 99. Sorry, I'm so old. <laughs> uh, what's a good movie? The Lord of the Rings movies were great. Love those. That's an incredible feat of cinematic something or other. It's phenomenal. <laughs> Daring do. Cinematic genius. Peter Jackson's pretty incredible. Anyone else? I heard a couple of them. Right here. Well, I guess I sort of misspoke a little bit. I mean, we knew the movie was called Gremlins, so obviously there would be gremlins in it. But we didn't have any inkling of anything having to do with the plot. We didn't know what an Agwai was. We didn't know about the transformation. We had no idea about the rules or any of that stuff. The only thing that we were allowed to see on all of these super red stamp secret pages was the scene where I asked her out on the date. But it's interesting what you, what you bring up, which is that when Phoebe and I were shooting it, we were like, how do you think it's going? We're like, oh, this is going pretty great. Huh? It's a pretty exciting movie. We thought we were going to make sort of an action movie. That's what it felt like. When we were making it, we thought it was kind of like this action film where we're running around. I mean, if you look, I'm, we're doing a lot of running around. And quick, we got to get out of here, right? And how that's the piece of dialogue that every actor dreads. Come, we got to get out of here. Let's go. Let's get out of here. You know, I mean, how do you play that? So it's like, let's get out. Gotta go. Let's, go. let's get out of here. You know, it just goes on forever. It's like, how do you do that 19 different, different ways? Let's get out of here. Uh, so we thought it was going to be really exciting. So then Joe decided, Joe Dante goes, uh, listen, we're going to have a big, big premiere at the man's, the ground, what's then called the Groundman's Chinese Theater. Um, you know, where we're going to put their, their feet and hands in the cement. So, um, he goes, but, but uh, actually, to imitate him, he goes, so before we do that, I want you guys to see the, you know, see the picture and see if you think it's good. And I said, uh, all right, yeah, we'll, we'd love to see it. So he gave a private screening for me, Phoebe, himself, and Mike Fennell in like a tiny screening room, probably about 150th the size of this. Probably had about 12 seats in it on Warner Brothers. So we went in and we saw it. And I, I got to tell you, the first time I saw it, you know, without an audience, I, I kind of didn't like it because it, it wasn't what I expected at all. I was like, I'm in a giant cartoon. What is like, it's, it's like a giant cartoon. And then I saw the bar scene, right? There, you, there was none, most of that was not scripted. You know, the, the, the Frank Sinatra gremlin over in the corner, and, you know, kind of be sad, and then the, then the puppet with the puppet, like the metaphysical things that's happening, and the guy picks up the, the sledgehammer and smashes him over the head. I'm looking, I'm looking at Phoebe, going, what the heck, what the hell is this? I don't, do, I don't remember the Frank Sinatra gremlin and then the Jennifer Beals gremlin doing the flash game stuff. With Michael Sandello doing gremlins, Mega Madness, we're like, what the hell, you know? Like, we, I thought I was going to be in, like, G, you know, James Cameron's Aliens, you know? Like, that was straight up. I thought I was like, yes, and I'm a macho guy, and I'm running around, and chopping off heads. And, and instead of in this, like, brightly colored, lit, strange, like, John Hora, the DP, is very strange DP. I mean, he uses all of these pastel colors everywhere, and it was all... So the whole thing, so I walked out with Phoebe, and I said, what do you think? She goes, what the hell is that? I go, I don't know. I have no idea. 
this one of the strange, we were in like one of the strangest mainstream movies I've ever seen. I just expected it to be slicker and not so Joe Dante kind of cartoonish. So we were both kind of like a little freaked out and a little nervous. Then we went to the screening at Grauman's Chinese Theater with about 1,700 people in it. And the place went berserk. Berserk. People were screaming, people were throwing stuff at the screens. My friend, one of my best friends I brought with me, he was sitting next to me, he turned to me and he whispered when, when Francis Lee McCain blew up the gremlin in the microwave and it went ding, and people were screaming and laughing so so loudly in the theater, you couldn't hear the ding. It was just like, <laughs> people screaming, stuff like that. And my friend leaned over and he shouted in my ear. That's how loud it was. He leaned over and he goes, this is going to be the hit of the summer. And he had to scream it because people were going to, so we were like, well, maybe the movie's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at Phoebe. Phoebe's sitting in front of me. I'm like, yes, I think we're, she's like, I think we're okay. <laughs> so now, of course, it is what it is. But at the time, you know, it's the shock of the new. We had absolute, I had absolute, I've only done two movies, three movies. Two movies, a couple of things on TV, and a venereal disease special. <laughs> so, I'm not joking. It's called A Very Delicate Matter. A very <laughs> Delicate Matter. And I have to share this with you because it's kind of funny. The climactic line in the, in the VD movie, in the VD after school special, would you like to know what it is? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, I was pretty surprised when Dr. Aranowitz gave me the news. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, I hadn't really done that much, and uh, and so I didn't I didn't know what to expect. So yeah, it was pretty it was pretty mind blowing. How was that for an answer? <laughs> yeah. Um, going back to the uh, production of the film, uh, you said it was filmed in the summer of '83, right? and we now consider this uh, a classic Christmas movie. What was it like filming this? all these Christmas scenes in the middle of summer in California with all the fake snow bundled up and everything in the heat? Uh, it was terrible. Uh, that's the short answer. The long answer is if you, if you look at what I'm actually wearing most of the time, I'm wearing a uh, t-shirt like I am now with a button-down shirt, then with a sweater, often a v-neck sweater, and then a, a tweed jacket with a parka over it. <laughs> so you're talking about four or five layers plus the knapsack that I would have. It was the hottest summer on record in Los Angeles when we shot it in June and July. So there would be times when I would be running through the snow, which was basically white sand, and it would be, you know, 105 degrees. We shot it in the San Fernando Valley. If you've ever been there, it's incredibly hot. It's probably like Austin in July. And so it was about, it averaged between 95 and 105 degrees most of that summer. And when we finally shot the scene, which is only one shot, but it, you know, if you know, know anything about filmmaking, it takes a long time to light and set up and you do multiple takes and whatnot. The scene down in the boiler room where I push the thing and I make the gas come out, the camera pans down, see the gas coming out. We shot that on Warner Brothers lot in an actual, uh, boiler room. And the temperature down in the boiler room was somewhere between 125 and 130 degrees. And so we had to, sh I had to shoot probably for about two and a half to three hours down in that boiler room wearing a parka. So I knew it was going to be an ugly day, so I weighed myself that morning just to see like how much weight I was going to lose because I knew I just was sweating away the pounds and stuff like that. And so from the morning to the evening, I lost six pounds of water weight shooting that scene. So it, was, it pretty much broke my internal uh, a thermometer. I'm really hardly ever hot or cold, particularly ever, ever since shooting that movie. I walk around all the time, and, and people are like, aren't you freezing? I'm like, not really. <laughs> not really. Aren't you hot? Not really. I don't really sweat that much. Basically, the whole thing just got jacked <coughs> up, and has never been fixed ever since. Just broke the whole, the whole thing just broke. Oh, there you go. Anyone else out there? You. I have two questions. One, is that your real hair in the movie? And two, can you tell me more about the puppets? Like, was there somebody like manning the puppets? Were you, were they acting with you, like moving while you were acting? What 
puppets are you talking about? Those are all actual, no, those are all creatures. They're all actual, actual creatures, you know. We just had to, we had a gremlin brain there. Now, um, my hair, you mean my Kirk Cameron special? <laughs> Basically what happened was, and this is kind of interesting, um, my left ear, uh, if you, if you look, watch the movie again next time, my left ear uh, stuck out like this, like a radar dish from the side of my head. The reason why it doesn't now is because in this summer of 1986, I had it pinned back so it matched my other ear. Because it looked ridiculous. I mean, it was just, there was only one, my one ear was fine, the other ear was like, hello. It was just <laughs> sticking out. So I would, whenever I get a short haircut, people call me Dumbo at school. I mean, I've actually never seen Dumbo for that reason. I swear to God. And um, so I just went to an all-boys school, which, you know, is pretty much like Lord of the Flies on steroids. So, <laughs> so I, I, what I would do is I would have this the hairstyle to cover my ear so I wouldn't get kind of, you know, tormented. So the, the uh, woman, uh, Sherry Ruff, who's the hair designer, you know, I didn't know anything. I mean, I'm shocked and appalled by my hairstyle now, 30 years later, but all she would do is she'd just spray it with like a mister. And then she would just kind of go shik, 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 like this, and whatever it did, it did. It was like a perm, or I don't know what it was. It was a disaster. It was like I stuck my finger in a light socket or something like that. But it's very 80s and very, very throwback. So that's what happened with that. As far as the puppet, and that, and that took me three minutes to answer. So the puppet answer is going to be about 97 minutes. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> the short version is. The, if there is a short version, is it took a, a number of people to operate the puppets. Gizmo himself was broken down into components. So you'd have one person would be operating the ears, another person would be operating the eyes, another person would be wiggling the nose, one person would be doing the mouth, another person would be doing the hands, etc. And each person would have a joystick that would control that aspect of the gizmo. And they practiced for about eight weeks before I even got there. So when I got there, they said, listen, We've been practicing for hours a day. So when you hold a gizmo in your hand, you can improv. What do you mean? They said, well, if you want to scratch his nose or, or take something away, just do what you would do naturally if it was a real thing. And we'll react. We've been practicing this. <laughs> so I said, OK. So I, they, they, they hooked the gizmo up to me, which is, it takes another 97 minutes to explain to you how they did that. But it was basically wires taped to my entire body is the short version. And so I would hold a gizmo, and they would have the cameras set up, monitors, and each person would have a video monitor with a joystick, and they would look at the video monitor, and somehow they would do the joystick together and make everything synchronized together as, as a movement. So it was, and, and in fact, what was weird is sometimes I would walk across the room, and they would have to follow me, but they couldn't be on camera. So the solution to that was, if you notice, you almost never see below my waist in the entire movie. And the reason why you never see below my waist is because all of the people who were doing the joysticks are crouched down on their hands and knees, crawling on the floor with the joysticks just underneath the camera uh, uh, lens. So sometimes we do have a great take, but we couldn't do it because like technician number four's head, the top of his head, was in the bottom of the frame. So there were a lot of, a lot of redos and stuff like that, but it was incredibly complicated. Um, it got a little less so when Rick Baker took over for Gremlins 2, because he's you know, maybe the greatest, smartest person who's ever been involved in film in, in his history. If you don't know about Rick Baker, that he's so, so incredible they created his own category in the Oscars to give him, we have to give him something. Let's create this category. Okay, give it to Rick Baker, he's a genius. So it, it got a little less complicated with Gremlins too, but yeah, it was, it was pretty amazing. Anyone else? You in the red in the back. So you mentioned the bar scene earlier. I was just wondering if you have like, a favorite Gremlin character out of those movies that's like kind of stand out you like. It's kind of hard not to like the flasher Gremlin. <laughs> <laughs> the flasher Gremlin is just so, just the pure expression of the id, you know? It's just. Pure impulse in the, in the form of three foot green thing. So yeah, we got one over here. here. What are your feelings about the sequel? About Gremlins Two? Yeah. 
You know, the thing about Gremlins 2 is I, I like it more now than I did then. I liked it then. Uh, to me, I think what made Gremlins 1 really work well was the integration of the people with, with the gizmos and, and, and with, with the Gremlins. And I think in Gremlins 2, sometimes you would have long sections where there was like 10 or 12 minutes where it was just Gremlins. And it kind of, after a while, started to me, personally, just started to feel a bit like a Muppet movie. It was like the bar scene really pushes it to the breaking point, but it also has Phoebe in it, you know? So that, that's a big help. And, but in Gremlins 2, there were just times when I was like, you know, it, it was a bit, it was a bit muppet to me. I think they needed more human interaction with it to kind of ground it in, in, in reality. But it's an incredibly subversive and, and brave movie, Gremlins 2. I mean, can you think of any other sequel whose entire purpose is to make fun of the first successful movie? I mean, I don't think uh, it's ever been done. Let's talk about the chainsaw. Baseball bat and the chainsaw scene. Understand that wasn't scripted. <laughs> You know, Joe and I were walking through the sets in both Gremlins movies were just fantastic, and that's due to John Spencer, the production designer, was incredible. So we were walking through the department store, and I was like, wow, you really stocked this with everything. Like, even stuff we don't see over in the corner, stocked with everything. I said, look, there's a chainsaw up there on the wall, you know? It's like a Toby Hooper uh, homage to Toby Hooper. And he's like, yeah. And Joe's like, yeah, I'm gonna put a couple of chainsaws in there. And I was like, wouldn't that be cool if like when I have the bat, he comes at me with a chainsaw and we have like a bat chainsaw kind of like battle. Would that be awesome? I'd thrown out tons of suggestions and Joe would kind of usually gone, no, actually that wouldn't be awesome. They'd usually shoot me down. Uh, he goes, that's a great idea. Why don't we do that? And I said, seriously? And he goes, seriously, well, let's just do it. So they figured out a way to take the blade off of the chainsaw. Uh, for most of the scenes, but there is one the one key shot where you see the chainsaw eating away at the bat They had the real chainsaw blade on and I was just instructed you cannot move your hands Even remotely but now of course we look back and that's just insanity But at the time it seemed like a good idea. And so yeah, so uh, So yeah, there was chainsawing way through the bat with the real blade Bat you gave away was the was the one that was left left over. <coughs> the bat I gave away was it was the one that was left over from that. We only used one, so there was only one. So I had that one. <coughs> any other questions? Okay. Was there any uh, scene? Because a lot of times scenes get edited out. Was there a scene that was edited out? You were like, man, I really wish this would have been in the movie because I did such a great job, or I felt I felt like it should have been in there. Well, I, I actually never, I did actually don't really think I did that great a job in Gremlins. I thought I was fine in it. I thought, I, I think that if you look at other stuff I've done, I did a way better job in it. So it's always a little bit irritating to me that like what I think of as my weakest performance is like my best known one. But thank, but, uh, thank you for that. Or why am I thanking you? I lost it. Anyway, uh, uh, what was the question? <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah, there was one, and they put it in the deleted scenes. If you, if you look at there's a great scene where we finally find that there's a resolution to Judge Reinhold's character where we discover Gerald locked away in the bank vault. And because uh, he, he hides, he goes in the bank vault and locks himself in with the bunny, you know, which is very um, character, character correct for, for Gerald. Um, one thing I was telling Bill, too, which most people don't pick up on, I don't know if you did, did, did people notice that all of Mrs. Deagle's cats are named after some form of currency? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. I'm glad you got that. Dollar bill is obviously the most obvious one, but Kopeck, and then there's a little little bowl where it says drachma on it that the cat is eating. Oh, that's kind of funny. So I wish that they'd left the, the, um, the vault scene in. I've actually seen that scene. I was like, didn't there was a vault scene there? I've actually seen it. It's really good. Oh. Thanks. Any others? Right in the back. Uh, do you keep in touch with any of the uh, cast or crew members? Sure. I mean, I see Joe from time to time. We're pretty much, you know, this, this movie pretty much binds us together for all time. And Dick Miller, I see a bunch. In fact, I did a, uh, a documentary called That Guy, Dick Miller, which is coming out. Uh, probably going to premiere here in Austin, South by Southwest in March. Uh, basically a look at Dick's rather astounding career if you look at all the people that he's worked with from Tarantino to James Cameron to Joe Dante 
John Wayne. I mean, it's just ridiculous the number of people that he's actually worked with. So, so yeah, no, I see people from time to time. Unfortunately, some of them have passed away. Scott Brady's gone. Played Axton, sadly, is gone. Um, Key Luke, who played Mr. Wing, is gone. So it's kind of, it's a little bittersweet looking at the movie. But then you have people like Jonathan Banks, who was so great on Breaking Bad just this year. He's fantastic. He played uh, the deputy sheriff. Anyone else? Yeah. I know as far as the deleted scenes, I had one where like, the mother's head was cut off. Really? Or, or they were going to. That's a script cut. Not, 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 nothing we shot. So how dark was it before when they, how dark was the movie going to be before they went like a family direction? Kind of? Much darker. And once Spielberg got involved, he was like, are you kidding? You can't cut off the mom's head. we got to lighten this up. You know, as soon as he got in, it didn't, uh, I wouldn't say that he turned it saccharine, but I think he stopped it from being like kind of uh, just plain violent. I think if you see if you see the Critters or the Ghoulies movies, I think those are closer to kind of what Gremlins was originally intended to be. And then Spielberg was like, no, you've got to make it like, uh, what did Joe call it? It's a wonderful lizard of Oz in hell. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's tapped out. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, you were mentioning earlier that you had a couple of ideas that just never got used. What was your favorite one that you wish would have been used in a movie? If you can remember. I think this is the scene where I kissed Phoebe a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't with that um, it's 30 years, I swear. I, I just remember coming up with them. They probably they probably got discarded because they weren't good. I don't really I don't really think I remember. Um, we ask uh, all the people that we've uh, interviewed over this last year, we've asked them one question. You might have actually kind of answered it earlier uh, when you were naming the films that you like. But you know, we've asked everybody, what is your favorite horror film of all time and why? I would say it's probably a tie between The Exorcist, which I still think is one of the greatest, uh, that's a, almost a perfect movie too. William Friedkin's direction in that movie is just unbelievable. And I think that the fact what makes it so great is how he grounded it so totally in reality. It seems like it actually could be happening, which is why I think it scared people so much. And then I already did answer it. John Carpenter's The Thing um, just features an incredible star turn by Kurt Russell, who's just magnificent in that movie. Most of the actors are incredible in that movie. And you could argue that Rob Bottin's special effects work in that movie is the best that's ever been put on on the screen in terms of practical effects. Practical effects in that movie are, the uh, special effects people, go ahead, give Rob a piece. The spe special effects in that movie, special effects people that I know still look at it 30 years later and go, I have no idea. I mean, they know how they did it, but they're like, how did anyone think of that at that time? It's just so revolutionary. And of course, it's got the amazing score and the incredible downbeat ambiguous ending, which of course, growing up in the 70s, I love downbeat ambiguous endings, which we had until Rocky. Now we've had nothing but happy endings for 40 years. <laughs> Everybody wins at the end, yay! Right? I mean, when's the last time you saw a movie with a terrible ending, where just everybody dies and it's just a mess? No country for old men. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, good for you. <laughs> Anyone want this picture? Um, you actually started to talk about Rob Boutin, and I was actually going to ask you a question and decided not to, but I will because you brought it up. Um, and that was, you know, Gremlins is an iconic creature feature. It's old school puppeteering, and, you know, you kind of verged on the Muppet aspect of it. But now we've got all these new techniques, and people aren't, you know, spending hours taping wires up to you. How do you feel about, I guess, the way that special effects are now? Do you feel like the creativity is still curbed, or... Or it's curbing because you get to do everything so easy, or do you, I mean, do you like the way it is? I mean, personally, The Thing is one of my favorite movies. I love the special effects that existed in the 80s. I thought it was inventive and interesting. And I guess what I'm really asking is just how do you feel about movies now with the effects that are brought in? I mean, they're more realistic, but... You're talking about CGI? I'm talking about CGI, but just, the, yeah, like the effects. They have more uh, to work with, essentially. Well, you know, I mean, CGI in a way is still kind of in its infancy. 
to a certain extent. Um, and you see it get better and better. Like when I saw that most recent uh, Planet of the Apes movie with James Franco in it, there's some pretty remarkable stuff in there that they managed to achieve. And so, you know, you see some of the earlier stuff, like maybe Ang Lee's The Hulk, you know, where it doesn't really work, it doesn't really quite work. Um, but then you see that, and it, it really kind of, I really kind of enjoyed that movie, and that really worked for me. So, you know, most CGI to me still just looks off to me. Somehow it just looks sort of like a cartoon, or it looks like a drawing or something. So I don't really like it all that much, but... Um, it seems to be getting better, and, and per, my guess is five or ten years from now it'll be just staggering. I just think the technology needs to kind of catch up with what people are trying to do with it. Anyone else? Have you uh, ever considered doing any voice acting work? Voice acting work? Yes. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, I've actually, if you look at my IMDb, I've done some some voice work um, okay. things and. And actually, uh, this is a little known fact. I mean, Disney used to, when I was living in Los Angeles, Disney would call me in and have me read for uh, all of their big movies. So I was like runner up for The Beast and Beauty and the Beast. Um, I read for Hercules. I read for, uh, I read for most, most uh, uh, Disney movies, starting from around The Lion King up until including maybe the Quasimodo ones, that Hunchback in Notre Dame. So I read for all of those and, and came close, but did, unfortunately didn't get any of them since the competition was pretty ferocious. Anyone else? Are we gonna go ahead and do this meet and greet thing? Meet and greet. People, right? people are getting sleepy. Right on. Let's, <laughs> how about let's step up on the give Zach a hand? <laughs> and so here's, here's how we're going to do this. Anyone who wants um, a, just like a camera phone picture with me, that's totally fine and that's free. Anyone who wants me to sign anything that they brought, that's totally fine and that's totally free. I brought a few uh, really nice uh, stills of me and the gizzard. Um, so if you want to, an autographed still, that's going to be 10 bucks because it costs me money to have them printed up. Everything else, though, I'm happy to give to you totally for free, just, you know, because you guys are such awesome supporters and everything. But I can't really afford to lose money on the pictures. So that's the way that's going to be. Okay? Cool.